Hello, good afternoon. My name is Jocelyn Cesari. I am a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs at Georgetown University. And it's my great pleasure to have this afternoon um, our special guest, Professor Muktadar Khan, who is an alumnus of Georgetown, where he completed his PhD and who is a professor of political science and international relation at the University of Delaware, not very far uh, from us. And uh, this afternoon, we're gonna have a discussion, conversation based on his most recent book, which is called um, Islam and Good Governance, a political philosophy of Ihsan. So Moktedar, uh, could you tell us, uh, including for the one who may not be familiar with the concept of Ihsan, what is, what is the main goal of this book and, and how do you address this question of good governance in it? Uh, thank you for inviting me, Jocelyn, for this conversation. I always, uh... Uh, enjoy speaking to my alma mater. And uh, so after having spent five wonderful years at Georgetown, I really love returning to it. This is a virtual return. Uh, in, in, in this book, uh, Islam and Good Governance, I have tried to accomplish three or four goals. My most important goal is to address those Muslims who feel that Islam has an important role to play in the public sphere. And for those scholars of Islam and those people in the media and government who deal with this issue of Islam's presence in the public sphere, I have a few things to say to them. One of my main points is that there is a diversity in the way Muslims have thought about the role of Islam in the public sphere. So there is a diversity of approaches to Islamic politics. And unfortunately, in the past few years, because of the rise of Islamic movements, what is generally referred to as political Islam, one particular mode of thinking about Islamic politics has been privileged. Uh, and that mode of thinking is that the structure of Islam in politics is that of a caliphate and the content of politics is essentially implementation of Sharia in the public sphere and every aspect of Muslim life. That is one goal to say that, no, there are other ways of thinking, and I will shortly share with you what the other ways of thinking about Islamic politics are. The second point that I want to make is that, and this is important, that even in the way Muslims have understood Islam, they have become obsessed with legalism and Sharia. Sharia occurs in the Quran only four times and only two times in the manner in which Muslims talk about Sharia. And of the two times when it addresses divine law, one is in chapter five, verse 48, God is actually talking about pluralism rather than imposition of a singular and archaic or medieval conception of the Sharia. So, the, so I want to deconstruct this Sharia obsession and try to tell Muslims that there are other ways of thinking about ethics and values within the Islamic context. And in this endeavor, I have tried to reintroduce the concept of Hassan to Muslims and also to those who think of politics. Now, if you ask what is Hassan, now there are two ways of thinking about Hassan. One is a mystical way of thinking about Hassan and the other is more of a spiritual and a ritual way of thinking. The simpler way of thinking about Islam, Ahsan is uh, when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him said, Ahsan is to do things in a beautiful way. He says that God has commanded Muslims to do Ahsan in every aspect of life. Kataba Allah, Kataba ala in everything. God has commanded Muslims to do Ahsan in everything. And Ahsan here is linguistically understood as to do beautiful things, to think, make things look better. Then there is this mystical concept of Ahsan, which comes from this famous hadith of Jibreel, 
in which uh, Archangel Gabriel comes and asks five questions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, publicly in his mosque. Uh, and, and the Prophet answers these questions. Uh, it's often also known as the Hadith of Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. So the five questions that Archangel Gabriel asks is what is Islam, what is Iman, what is Ihsan, uh, when is the day of judgment, and what are the signs of the day of judgment? The Prophet answers four of them. He says, I don't know, and neither do you know about when the day of judgment is coming. But when he's asked this question, Ahbadni an al Ihsan, Tell me about Ihsan. The Prophet said something which is mind blowing. He says, Antabudu Allah ka anna ka tarahu, tarahu innahu He says that Ihsan is to worship God as if you see him. And if you cannot see him, then know that he sees you. So this mystical concept of Ihsan is to do beautiful things and you're doing it as if you have you are seeing God. But you're also supposed to know that God is seeing you. So what it does, it establishes a mutual co-constitutive relationship between the worshiper and God, where both are witnessing each other. So God is always witnessing you, but if you are in a state of Ahsan, you are witnessing God. I call it making eye contact with God. So to be in a state of Ahsan is to live life as if you have made eye contact with God. So the book asks the question, if God has commanded Muslims to do Ahsan in everything, then why not in politics? And so I go out to do this. I think there are many ways of thinking about Islamic politics. One way of thinking about it is, is through Ahsan. And Ahsan uh, is the highest virtue in Islam. So if you want to have the most beautiful manifestation of Islam in the public sphere, then it will be through the formation of a society of Muslims, those who are in a state of Ihsan, those who are pursuing Ihsan. Thank you. Um, before we go on concretely what it would mean, and uh, I, I would like to go back to your assessment, and I cannot agree more with you about the lack of diversity and the, what some would call the legal fetishism of Islamic thinking today. And um, this happen and people have to be very aware of that because it's counterintuitive to a lot of the um, common parlance about Islam. This happened in modern time, this um, loss of diversity and this uh, focus on law um, and not so much on principles of law uh, happen in modern time. Because you mentioned Sharia, Sharia until the end of the uh, caliphate is not uh, the law, it is a methodology. It is a way that the ulema can produce some guidance for the Muslim communities. So it's not written anywhere. It is something that is part of the work of peers of, of uh, Muslim authorities that work together to produce guidance for communities, most of them local, because there is no nation. And, and so there is a great sense of empowerment, of autonomy, that is far from being dependent on like what people think from a sort of central you know, political authority. And what I have shown is that this um, situation disappeared with the nation state. The fact that Sharia became part of the state law, most of the time um, remnant of the family code reshaped to, to match the need and the, the, the specificity of the, of the state. And that's, on that particular um, perception of Sharia that indeed you can claim an Islamic state. You, 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 there is nothing in the Islamic tradition about the state being the preferred or pri privileged form of doing politics, right? So I really appreciate the force like you that are trying to step away from that because it's a very, um, challenging, and you rightly said, it's not only challenging for the non-Muslims, it's also challenging for Muslims who have been educated, socialized, I would say for more than a century now, uh, in, in this kind of vision of, of Islam. 
Um, so how do you propose through this book to reopen the path toward this diversity and toward the less, I would say, state-centered approach to governance. Because also, let's be clear here, governance doesn't mean automatically taking on the state. If you have local actions that can be readable by the state or political institution, it's also part of good governance. You don't need to win an election to do good governance. So what is your uh, proposed? path in this book in order to uh, implement this governance outside of the state centrality, so to speak? So there is a three-step argument that I try to make in the book. One is I try to reintroduce the idea of Ihsan and its importance and try to uh, remind Muslims that this is the highest of our aspirations. Most uh, branches of Muslim thought have only given lip service to Ahsan. Uh, it is so ironic that my book starts with the Hadith of Jibreel, uh, and so does uh, the work of Ibn Taymiyyah's Kitab al-Iman. But what was interesting is he focuses on Iman. He's obsessed with who is Muslim and who is not, uh, and, and he just gives lip service to Ahsan. The second point I wanted to make was that there is a a juncture in Muslim history, and it could be pointed to the advent of modernity or colonialism, where there is a huge divergence between the past and the present. So when Muslims thought about Islam in the past, I articulate that, that they have Islamic theories of the state. So you have Al-Farabi advancing an Islamic theory of the state where he envisages the state as a state which will be perfect, attain happiness. It will create a system where individuals will have the opportunity to perfect their souls. Uh, and I realized that even though he was using the word kamil constantly, perfect, perfection is also one of the meanings of ahsan. So he doesn't use the word ahsan, but he's also talking about perfection and, uh, uh, and moral development of the society and individuals. And then you have somebody like Ibn Khaldun, who is also talking of an Islamic state, but he's, he's advancing Islamic knowledge, but about the state in general. Yes. Whereas in the modern period, instead of advancing Islamic theories of the state, people like Maududi and Sayyid Khutub and Nampani and others have, have advanced theories of the Islamic state. So rather than Islamic thinking about the state, you now have thinking about the Islamic state. So what is problematized is not what kind of a polity should we have? That was Farabi's problem. That was Ibn Khaldun's concern. Uh, even people like uh, Mawardi and Ibn Taymiyyah were saying, what is a legitimate way of governing? What is a good way of governing? But the modern Muslim think, especially who are persuaded that Islam should play a role in the public policy, they're not asking that question. They're not asking the question like, which is the best way to govern in the world today, in the postmodern world, in the age of globalization. They are only concerned with how can we create an Islamic state? Yes. That seems to be their goal. That seems to be the political goal. They do not ask the question, is the Islamic state the best response to the challenges of the Muslim world today? That is not part of the conversation at all. So they think it is the divine purpose of Muslims to, to produce this Islamic state. And even the Islamic state is very narrowly defined. It's defined in the, it's like a combination of Al-Mawardi's Khilafa and Ibn Taymiyyah's Sharia. So they have this structure. If you take their, look at their work clearly, it is a very severe, uh, very even totalitarian, and also racist state. al mawardi says basically that in an Islamic caliphate, only people from one particular tribe, the Quraysh, can be legitimate rulers. So if you're not a member of the, the Quraysh, then you can't be. And you know, it is so astonishing that he attributes this to the first caliph, Abu Bakr, and says Abu Bakr justified his governance by saying that the prophet said that only people from the Quraysh can be rulers and the wazirs should be from people of Medina. I mean, how can we establish a governance system in Indonesia or Turkey where there are no Arabs? <laughs> Forget about bringing Quraysh there. So Muslims 
I mean, this is a few days after the last, I mean, the prophet gave the final khutbah in which he said there is no difference between an Arab and a non-Arab. And then you have a Khilafah system established immediately after his death, which is premised on uh, the privileging of a particular tribal identity. And then when Ibn Taymiyyah comes, and I want to share this with you, and I want Muslims also to listen to this, he narrates a particular episode from the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which he says that a man stole another man's mantle, a blanket, you may say. So the guy who owned the blanket caught the guy who stole the blanket and brought him, brought him to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And the Prophet said, since you stole the blanket, we should amputate your hand and wanted to implement the Sharia. The man who owned the blanket was horrified at the idea that another man would lose a hand for just his blanket. So he says, I will gift him my blanket, basically to rescue him from that punishment. So it is quite obvious that even some of the companions of the prophet were horrified by the severity of the punishment and they thought it was not proportional, obviously. But the prophet apparently insisted that forgiveness should have come before he reported it. Mm. And apparently the prophet insisted that the man's hand be amputed. And I'm looking at this story and so Ibn Taymiyyah is making the case of imposing a very severe interpretation of Islamic law. And so you can see why ISIS is what ISIS is. The severity and the barbarity with which the ISIS were trying to implement Sharia law, throwing gay people from buildings, executing publicly, it's very strange. And the Quran says that we have sent Muhammad as nothing but mercy to humanity. And I'm wondering where is that mercy and compassion and forgiveness? There are many verses in the Quran which says forgive. And so if this man was for forgiving that person, what business does the state have mm -hmm. of imposing it? So to me, this whole idea of this medieval conceptions of Sharia, et cetera, should be understood in the context in which they were articulated. Ibn Taymiyyah was like Sam Huntington, paranoid. You know, Huntington was paranoid that Islam and China would get together and destroy the West and Hispanic migration would destroy liberal democracy from inside. And Ibn Taymiyyah was also like that. He thought the Mongols and the Crusaders would destroy Islam from the outside and Sufis and philosophers would destroy Islam from inside. So his interpretation of Islam is very insecure, very frightened and very narrow and, and something that is immune to reinterpretation. So that's the first thing I want Muslims to understand that these are not our models for us to emulate. Our, our role model is the prophet. And so I want me, people to move away from the model of the Khilafah and go to the model of the Madinan constitution, the 10 years of the prophet's governance. And I read the 10 years of prophet's governance in Medina as a state which had a constitution. The prophet did not say, I'm the prophet of God and so I rule over you. He ruled by virtue of consent. The constitution of Medina was both a consent from those who were governed and also a social contract on the basis of which the rights and duties of every community was articulated. So constitutionalism can be drawn from that social contract, consent to govern. And what was also interesting and important to me was that this first Islamic state was a multi-ethnic, multi-religious state. So countries like France and Malaysia and India, these multi-religious, multi-ethnic states should be able to draw direct lessons from the prophet's governance, Islamic uh, Islam is based on the message of God, the Quran, and the practice of Prophet Muhammad, not anybody else, not Ibn Taymiyyah, not Mawardi, and not even the Khulafai Rashidin. So that's the second part I want to do. The third message that I plan to suggest is this, that let's not focus about the structure so much. Like it doesn't matter whether it's a liberal democracy, radical democracy, or what. What is important is the content of what is delivered in public service. So, so to me, the key questions are, are we delivering social justice? Are we delivering equity? You know, there are, every Friday, Muslims end sermons by saying, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. 
Indeed, God has commanded justice with Asa. Justice with Asa. So Asa is mercy, compassion, and love. And justice is equality. So God is also saying that just justice is not enough. You have to have justice plus. And mm-hmm. that should be the content. So when we articulate policies, those policies should be measured on these two parameters of justice and and Ahsan. Is it a beautiful policy? Is it compassionate? Is it merciful? Now people think that these terms like forgiveness and compassion, et cetera, are just uh, words. They, They do translate into policy and you can see in the United States, for example, the laws about bankruptcy are essentially uh, the codification of forgiveness at one point. It is like you're bringing forgiveness. This is coming from the Judeo-Christian tradition of forgiveness into the, the public system. So we have parole systems. These are all aspects of forgiveness. So, so I try to articulate in my last chapter certain shifts that Muslims should make in their thinking about politics. So for example, I talk about how to do Sharia through Shura. You know, Muslims think of Sharia as given and Mm -hmm. Shura as a process. But what I want to argue that what is Sharia should not be prior of Shura, but it should be the product of Shura. So you have a consultative process and ask what is the Islamic ruling in this state? Tomorrow, I'm participating in a public discussion in Delaware on euthanasia. So there is a bill in the house, the state about, should we permit uh, physician assisted suicide for people who are in tremendous pain, et cetera. So what is the Islamic, so we, it's a consultative process. So the law is going to emerge after this public deliberation. And so I argue that one way to change this politics is for Muslims to come to the understanding that there are many ways of articulating what is Sharia, and let's debate that through the process of shura and then come up with what is sharia. So what you are pointing out is actually a, a very um, painful um, situation of Islam today, which is uh, the lack of understanding of history. And uh, I would, for the sake of argument, push back a little on, on on saying that Khilafah was totalitarian. Uh, Actually, all historical accounts show that the caliphate was was not totalitarian. First, because it was not a state. I think we have to be clear here that the state is this modern institution of a central political power exerting control on a portion of territory. By all means, the empires from Abbasid to Ottoman were not Umayyad, were not states. There was no as such a central power, except when, when the caliph had to go to war. But, but the diversity was there, the plurality was there. Uh, the, uh, it was a multilinguistic, multi-ethnic, multicultural, and it did include religious minorities. So, of course, if we do an acronym and we think that this had to be equal, equalitarian in the sense of secular, of course, it didn't exist. But it didn't exist in Europe either at the same time. So, what I'm trying to tell here is that. All what you are saying is actually in the Islamic tradition, not the modern understanding of tradition of the past, but the tradition in Islam, the method by which uh, scholars and religious authority give meaning to communities locally and in all aspects of the empire, these communities were never for Muslims. The Maslaha, was not the state interest. The maslaha was the common good of the community that some guidance, since that some authority was guiding day to day, and it was indeed bottom up. So Sharia was not a law. Sharia was a way for religious authority to provide civility to local communities. And, and, and I think the issue is that, that's what I tried to show in my, in my 
own work is that the, uh, with the end of the caliphate, historical caliphate, the rise of the nation state, young Muslim and even elderly Muslim are reading the caliphate through the lens of the nation state. But it has never been because the nation state, as you said about nationalism being it's an homogenization process. It means that the state do, did its best to create a connection between a certain brand of Islam, a certain ethnicity, and the state power. So I think that that's the issue here, because we are not looking at the past with, with indeed, you're absolutely right, saying relocating. We cannot look at even even if the Tamiya, you know, he was not, he, he spent his time in jail because what he was saying was not part of what indeed was the consensus of the time. So that's why the people of ISIS cannot re reconnect with this place. They have not been educated into it. They have no clue what this means. They, they, they have not been taught their Islamic tradition. It may sound a little blunt to say it like that, but that's the issue right there. So what they re duplicate is indeed an even more homogeneous political system than the nation state. And it is indeed totalitarian. So see, the thing is that I'm not saying that the period of the Khilafah was totalitarian. I'm saying that if uh, al mawardis theory and the way Ibn Taymiyyah then picked it up uh, is a totalitarian vision. So yeah. for example, so for example, when you look at uh, Mawardi or even Al-Qaeda or ISIS or even Nabhani's vision of the caliphate, yeah. some of them use the same caliphate to say Islam is democratic. Look, yeah, we, elected, we elected the caliph, right? But what they don't understand is they treat all the four caliphs as if it's a similar model. But if you notice, it's all different. The Prophet, peace be upon him, did not appoint a successor. Abu Bakr appointed a successor. Uh, Umar did not appoint a successor. He appointed an electoral college to elect the successor. And I think Usman was prematurely assassinated before he could plan his succession. And so we don't have a plan. So if you notice, the entire period of the Khilafah is more innovative. Yes. And responding to times and circumstances, then trying to implement some imaginary, socially constructed conception of the Khilafah or Islamic law. Yeah. Uh, and that is very important. So, for example, what to call the caliph? Like, they didn't know what to call each other. And so, so it was, I think, Imam Ali who recommended to the second caliph that, well, you are the commander of the faithful. So instead of calling yourself the Khalifa of the Khalifa of Rasulullah, I mean, it would go on and on, right? Khalifa of the Khalifa of the Khalifa of Rasulullah. <laughs> you should call yourself Amir al mumineen And that's why both, um, they, they subsequently. So they were sort of making it up as they went along, but they were in in the context of the Islamic milieu of that time, right? But today we have this bizarre situation, for example, at one particular university here in the, in the US, uh, they were having a seminar for the MSA on Islamic inheritance laws. And I, I, I was there lecturing at the university. So I went there and I said, by the way, are you also going to tell them what the American laws are? Because some of the things that you just said our country. Yes. So are you going to advocate that they break the American law? Uh, what is really more important for Muslims today is to know what the inheritance process is, how to transfer wealth to your children, how to distribute your wealth, and also make a will for God's sake, you know? So rather than training Muslims to live in the real world, what the MSA was doing was training them to live in an imaginary caliphate where the Sharia law as articulated by somebody a few hundred years ago was implemented. That law is not implemented anywhere. So I think that there is this disjuncture, which is, uh, I think, a fundamental treatment of modernity as illegitimate in the eyes of Muslims. And we have not yet fully come to terms with uh, uh, with modernity and therefore the most important element of modernity, which is the nation state. Yes. Uh, and so even though Muslims live in kind of nation state, their conception of citizenship, their allegiance to the law of the land is, is kind of bifurcated 
So they are living in this imaginary Islamic state in their head and the real state, whether they are in Egypt or Tunisia, so every state appears illegitimate, every legal system appears illegitimate. I mean, we are living in a, in a world at a moment where not only failing and fragile states proliferate in the Muslim world, but the, the core part of the Muslim world, the Middle East, is essentially a failing region. And I, and I think because Muslims have simply focused on legitimacy and structure of governance rather than good governance. Mm. I, I, I don't care if Saudi Arabia has a monarchy as long as they are able to deliver good governance. That is more important. Like we have had democracy in the US in the last four years, but I don't think we have been delivering good governance. Look at our healthcare crisis, et cetera. So, so, so we have to balance this idea. And so one goal of the book is to ask Muslims to think in terms of good governance. It's more about outcomes of government. Like, is there equity in society? Is there harmony in society? Do you have the freedom to practice your faith and perfect your soul. If this is the objective of human being on this, you have to have tremendous autonomy and freedom of conscience to be able to do tasky enough to purify your soul. If you are not free to impact your own soul, how can you uh, become a better person? So, so to me, that's why I have this extended discussion on freedom uh, in, in, the, in the book and I argue that uh, and also that's why I'm very critical of this concept of the Mahasid al Sharia approach that is constant. I mean, the five Mahasid do not include justice or freedom. So how can you have a society where the, the people are not free? Uh, and so there are serious issues that Muslims need to, to be talking about from a governance perspective. Uh, it is in this context that I have started a project uh, in partnership with IIIT called uh, Islam uh, Universal Values and Good Governance. And so we are going to do a series of symposiums where we are focusing on good governance. So the first project was actually a symposium on my book where several scholars responded. The next one is authoritarianism and good governance. So you see with the rise of populism and authoritarianism, we have this very strange dilemma in the world today where democracies like the United States and India are failing their public and authoritarian regimes like Singapore and China are delivering some essential public goods. They may not give you freedom, but they have given you freedom from COVID, for example. So I have a, I have a fear that authoritarian models will become more popular, especially in societies which have not fully embraced liberal values. Yeah. And so in, in that context, we really need to talk about good governance and what it means. I think Muslims need to have a global conversation about what is good governance? What would they like to see in their society? Not enforcement of certain laws, but in terms of what are the parameters of society, high levels of education, high levels of health, high levels of happiness. This is what I want them to ask for. Yes, actually, authoritarianism is growing everywhere, including in so-called established democracy. There was a survey done recently that uh, among the, the followers of the Republican Party in the US, there is a growing uh, part of it that, that considered democracy less relevant than other ways of governing. And if you look at surveys done across the youth, which I found the most problematic and worrisome, young people are less and less convinced that democracy is the best way of government. So there are lots of worrying signs here above Islam or beyond Islam. And I think it would be also good at some point, not everybody, but it's good also to keep an eye on these global trends uh, that, that cut across uh, even, I would say, the specificity of, of Islam. Before we keep going, I have already, or we have already four long questions. So I'm going to start with, um, we're going to take them one by one. So the first one uh, probably refer to the beginning of our discussion. Are there any Muslim majority countries that are moving in this direction that we discuss in the way that you put governance? 
Look, if you had asked me this question 10 years ago, <laughs> then uh, I would have pointed towards Turkey and Malaysia and into some extent Indonesia as countries which are moving towards uh, focusing and providing good governance. And you could see this in, in Turkey. Uh, uh, the first time I went to Turkey in 2008, and I was surprised that how many things worked. And mm -hmm. people were providing uh, good education, they were providing good transportation, the quality of life was improving, uh, the, le uh, the, the level of income was rising, etc. So just standard measures of good governance you could see in these countries. But now all of these countries are also getting uh, involved in identity politics. Yes. Uh, and one of the problems with identity politics is that the identity struggles undermine values. Uh, people often think that values are integral part of identity. No, projecting an Islamic identity is one thing, practicing Islamic values is another thing. So for example, if, if the president or leader of any of these countries would ask me, I want to project my Islamic identity. Then I'll say, okay, pass a fatwa against Salman Rushdie, make a conference on Gaza, you know, these symbolic things where you project yourself as a quote unquote Islamic state, enforce hijab on all women, in just a few symbolic things. Uh, it's like the way we make our car Islamic. We buy a Korean car and then we paint it green, put a number thing, 786, hang a touch B, and okay, okay, it's a halal car now. It's just, you know, superficial uh, uh, model. But if you want to practice Islamic values, then the first question I would ask is income disparity. You know, mm -hmm. one of Prophet's companions said that there can be no poverty in an Islamic society. There can't be rich people and poor people. You have to ensure that there is distributive justice. That is why we have the concept of zakat. So, so then practicing Islamic values in a political sense becomes so much more difficult because you have to ensure that there is uh, economic equity. There is no difference between an Arab and a non-Arab. So there can be no uh, social inequity, et cetera. But there was also this hope after the Arab Spring that with democratization would come good governance in the Muslim world. Unfortunately, the Arab world is this unique example where neither democracy nor uh, uh, by democracy, whatever we see in Jordan and, and to some extent in Morocco uh, or, and under the Muslim Brotherhood's reign in Egypt, nor authoritarian systems have developed and provided good governance. Uh, I, would, uh, I would say that Tunisia has, despite all the difficulty and challenge, the evolution of the of thinking about Islam and governance in Tunisia under the leadership of Ranoushi has been moving into this direction with all the obstacles that we know, me meaning indeed keeping the focus on the institution of the state institution. But that's the problem when you are a political party. But if you see the thinking of Ranoushi, he has moved to in this direction you mentioned about a, a civic or civism, Islamic civism more than Islamic law. And so, but it's maybe too early to tell and there are too many challenges around uh, this uh, little experience to make it indeed a sort of uh, definitive case. No, but, but if you do, say, if you look at Malaysia, for example, yeah. to some extent, there are serious policy discussions about good governance, how to improve the quality of education how to improve the condition of women. There are backlashes going on. Uh, how to integrate non-Muslim minorities, right? There are much more sophisticated debates going yes. on. And the reason why those things are happening is because there is a modicum of democratic institutions. There is a modicum of, uh, of uh, freedom of speech, etc. you know? So Erdogan is famous for saying that, uh, that democracy is not the destination it is the train that will take you somewhere, right? And uh, people have been critical of him saying that, well, basically it meant that he will establish his own caliphate or dictatorship on this train using democracy. But I think that, look, democracy is a way of eliminating, it's a conflict resolution process within a state. If there are competing interests, the best way to resolve conflict is to democracy. It is not a guarantee of good governance. And four years of Donald Trump have convinced us that democracy is not necessarily going to deliver good governance. You need something more than just a democratic structure. 
But Muslims need some kind of democracy in order to be able to articulate competing visions of governance. Yeah. And so that there is autonomy. Like I should not be afraid that if I challenge this particular policy, they're going to respond by hanging me. You know, uh, I think of Mahmoud Taha of, <laughs> of Sudan, for example. Or so, so if, if I'm convinced that, okay, they may reject my idea, but they're not going to hang me, then I will feel free to advance and create a debate and an environment. And it is through this process of tadabbur deliberation, it is through this process of shura or consultation that better policies can be articulated. I argue in the book that we need four freedoms. Muslims need the freedom to do ishtihad, both Islamic law. Muslims need the freedom to also challenge past consensus. This whole idea of shutting down Islamic debate by saying, oh, we have an ijma on this. And I have this standard answer. If I'm not part of the ijma, there is no ijma for me. I don't care if all the Muslim world don't consider me as a scholar. I consider myself as a scholar of Islam. If I don't agree, there is no ijma. I should have the freedom to challenge the past ijma. And if it is valid, then a re-examination should merely reinforce it, right? So, so we need to have freedom to do ishtihad. We need to have freedom to do ijma. Non, and Muslims should also have the freedom not to fear the reprisals of state when they're critical of the governance of the state. And I think that is very important. It is only through creation of a self-critical society mm -hmm. that we can improve. That's why this ehsan and tasawwuf is very important. You know, there is a process called murahaba and muhasaba. Murahaba is vigilance, to keep an eye on yourself. Say, is what I'm doing the right thing? Is what I'm doing the correct thing? We use it only in spiritual sense. Did I pray five times today? Did I do my wudu properly? Is my beard of proper length? But beyond that, murahaba is not used. And then muhasaba is to keep an account, to be accountable. This needs to be institutionalized. And it is not difficult. In the past, Muslims did have institutionalization of muhasaba. We also have the GAO in the United States, right? Government accountability or organizer, whatever it's called that keeps track of government accountability. So Muslims need to be able to create this self-critical society, which will constantly work. It's like improving yourself every day. The prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, if you are the same person two days in a row, consider yourself a loser, which means you have missed 24 hours to become a better person. And the same thing should apply to a society that it should constantly be improving or it will decay. Thank you. So the other, there is another question. It's a little long, so I'm going to cut to the chase. Um, using Aristotle or Plato as contradiction, what socio-political framework may be best to use to bridge the framework? I'm not sure to understand. But also using Christendom as a comparison. How may conservative thought moderate public or present eschatological pools? I'm not sure I'm following this question. Well, well, you know, Islamic political philosophy is very interesting. Uh, I imagine Muslim philosophers standing in this posture where they have one hand in front and one hand in the back. In the hand in the front, they have Plato. So they are showing Plato and they are hiding Aristotle behind constantly because it's, uh, the philosophy is driven by Aristotle. And the most important part is causality. And if, if Muslims philosophers realize that the idea of causality contradicted with certain theological assumptions of decree and qadr, et cetera, that only God creates things, et cetera. There is no causality to things because then, it, then even miracles are called into question, et cetera, right? So, but without causality, you cannot have science. Uh, and so philosophers are particularly sensitive and try to protect Aristotle. But I, I have a feeling that some of the, best work in Islamic philosophy has been inspired by Aristotle. Ibn Khaldun's methodology is Aristotelian. Ibn Rushd is Aristotelian. Ibn Sina is Aristotelian. Uh, Farabi is more like Plato, but you know, I, Ibn Sina said that he did not understand Aristotle until he read Farabi. So it is important to understand that, that Islamic civilization if it were to pursue uh, the philosophical paradigm of politics of creating a state of uh, 
individuals who are intellectually sophisticated, you know, this dream of philosophers to have a philosopher king and to have, and we are actually moving towards that. People don't understand that having 30% college graduates in a country is an extremely sophisticated society, as opposed to be in the past where only 5%, 10% people were literate. Even governors and rulers were not literate uh, in the past, but today we have lawyers running the country. So we are, we are capable of producing a society where knowledge is very important. I mean, the World Bank has been talking about knowledge-based economies. <laughs> Why can't we talk about knowledge-based politics? I mean, this, this age of fake news and fake interpretations contradicts that, pers that, that perspective. But I think that for a good Islamic state based on Ahsan values, the Muslims have to know their tradition well, right? They have to know what is Ahsan. And Muslims have to be extremely literate in their own tradition to be able to apply their values today. So in that sense, the, the Aristotelian and, and uh, Neoplatonic models can be beneficial. Yes. Um, just a, a bifurcation question here. I'm not sure that Muslims have the institutions around them to be able to learn that tradition. That's a major challenge. Um, think of the potential if your kind of thinking was part of a structural effort to educate the new generation. You know, uh, that's that's what is missing, and and that's I think why most of the modern states in Muslim world have failed uh, in this incapacity to maintain the tradition alive. And the loss of uh, religiously uh, grounded thinking independent of the state. This has been, I would say, for Islam, the kiss of death, if I may say so. So there, there is a real challenge here. And for a while, I came to this country, I was a little naive. I thought that Islam could thrive outside this control and nationalization of Islam. And, and it has been a challenge here too. I'm not talking only about America. I come from Europe. So the situation is even worse over there to, to some extent. So this is a real challenge here. What do, what do we find these new spaces? So- You know, it is, it is what you're pointing is very troubling. So for example, did you know that Ibn Khaldun taught at Al-Azhar University. This is in the 13th and 14th century beginning, right? But he was not taught at Al-Azhar until 1905 or 1915, when uh, Muhammad Abdu was Sheikh Al-Azhar. He actually fought to include Ibn Khaldun in the syllabus. So, so to me, it is very, I mean, to be frank, for example, this book has been out for a few months now. And except for one invitation from Turkey and some discussions in Bosnia, uh, I have not got any invitation from Muslim countries to talk about it. Muslim countries are interested in inviting only those American Muslims oh, yeah. to talk to them who repeat to them what they already know. Mm -hmm. so if you're going to Turkey to talk about Ghazali, I mean, there are more better scholars of Ghazali sitting in Turkey yeah. and in, in other parts of the Muslim world. So uh, I, I really don't understand. And they don't have these institutions where they can do uh, as much independent research, They're free from government interference. Like when I was writing the book, I was not really worried at all about what the US government is going to say or not. <laughs> You know, and uh, and I wrote it as a believer, paid the price of not going to a university press where they loved the book, but they did like the fact that I was writing it as a believer, you know, and yeah. I had a very heated exchange with a very prominent academic press. And my last statement to that editor was, I said, you know what, I'm not going to stop being a believer, but I guarantee you, you are not going to publish this book, but you will probably publish 100 books on this book, <laughs> you know, so so you will not publish a book. I mean, if Madhudi sent his book to say Cambridge University Press, they would not, but they would publish hundred dissertations written on Madhudi's <laughs> book and work. So, so there are limitations and pressures even in the West for intellectual thought, but that is more about if you want academic success. But if you're not interested in just academic success, but you want to be to think freely and uh, impact the Muslim world, then I I see no 
no restrictions about it. Nobody stopped me from writing uh, and publishing and sharing like I'm doing right now. And so that is an important part. And for that, you need freedom of thought. And without freedom of thought, there will be no progress in the Muslim world. You cannot have good yeah. governments uh, uh, without freedom. Even in authoritarian regimes, you know, uh, there are these uh, consultative bodies where businesses consult with the government. And if you are afraid of the government, you're not going to give them correct data and the government then cannot make good policies. But if you trust the government, then you will share data. So, so in the past, uh, businesses shared data with Chinese government so the Chinese government can make good policies, the same in Japan and other parts where this uh, there has to be autonomy to share the truth. Otherwise, uh, we will not be able to, 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 to chart a path that will lead to us progress and development. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more questions and 10 minutes. So I may group a few of them together, if you don't mind, and address. Sure, 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 sure. sure. So the, the, other, the next one is about the extent to which Sharia allows for contextualization of matters of governance in regard to time and place. And then um, there is another one on uh, the West. And in the West, there is a particular conception of Islam as something bad. There is a danger of Muslims colluding with that in a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. How do you think they should respond instead? Meaning they are against the Muslims. Um, then I have... Uh, a question on Islamic countries. Where would both of you presenting place the religious maturity of the people, Ummah of Islam? How would you rate their relationship with minority who are in the neighbors? Um, also, I think of the cultural separation of Islamic country, Arab world, Turkey, Iran, etc. Is it valid to break them down by culture? And the last question is, in terms of education, being self-critical isn't part of the problem that ooh, we're talking about modern Western social scientists rather than in the mosque, hence in Islamic university. So how can we actually bring these kinds of discussions to the mosques? Well, that's, well let me start with the, the first question. And I forgot what, what was the first question. <laughs> This question was about Sharia and contextualization. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yes. So, for example, there is this famous episode that everybody talks about, about Imam Shafi, who, while he was in Baghdad, he was always debating the Hanafis and defending the Maliki school. And then when he came to Cairo, he started debating the Malikis and disagreeing with them. So when he was asked about an opinion, he gave an answer. And someone said, well, when you were in Baghdad, you gave a different answer to the same question. And so Imam Shah said, that was there, this is here, that was then, this is now. So where he very clearly said with variation in space and time, you can have a different answer to the same question. So, so in that sense, he very clearly tried to send the message that um, the context uh, in which Islam is understood can change. So, I mean, there is a traditional way of thinking that if the illa changes, the hukum changes. So if the context can change, then the judgment will also change. Muslims, Muslims need to know this. Ordinary Muslims need to know. The problem is not even the scholars of Islam. They know this stuff. They're just scared to death of the ordinary people. So what happens is rather than elevating the ordinary people to the, to the level of the scholar, the scholars are coming down. Yeah. to the level of the ordinary people. So even in the mosque, the last question about the mosque, the mosques, the scholar, usually the imam and the most educated person is not the mufti of the mosque. It is this doctor who writes the biggest check, the biggest donor of the mosque is the interpreter of Islamic law. If the imam comes up with an interpretation which is inconsistent with the biggest donor, then he is in trouble. So I find that, uh, that uh, the dumbest <laughs> or the least informed and the most powerful elements of the society control the interpretation of Islamic law and not the scholars. And until mosques come up with a tenure system, 
for their imams and their scholars, uh, then there, there will be no autonomy. Uh, I also give a lot of sermons and, and, I, and I say what I want to say. Sometimes mosque will never ever invite me back again and there are others who will invite me and then there will be <laughs> one mosque takes my videos, videotapes every sermon of mine because if there are bad things being spread lies, we can at least go back and check and say, did he say that? Did he say that? And I find it quite astonishing that people who really don't know what I'm talking about. So for example, at the beginning of COVID, I was talking about how Ibn Sina had come up with this idea of quarantine during, and, and, and even the prophet, one of the hadith is about shelter in place, you know? So I was saying that Muslims already talked about quarantining. Why are we finding this problematic? And the response was, Ibn Sina is a Shia. <laughs> So we don't want to. So we. Ha how do you deal with these issues, right? These these very narrow ways of thinking, lack of openness to to ideas, and I think that comes from an insecurity. I think most average Muslims know that they don't know about Islam, so they do not want to hear anything new because then they won't be able to judge its validity. So if they hear a new idea, they don't know whether it is valid. So for example, uh, when I said. Uh, to make eye contact with God. I had people saying, Nauzubillah and Astaghfirullah. And I said, what are you talking about? This concept of mushahada is so common. It's even in the Quran, <laughs> you know? Uh, I mean, uh, of Moses going and saying, Rabbi Arini Unzura, like, oh God, show thyself who I can see you. This is part of the Quran. And then he just said, oh, I didn't know. I said, you didn't know, but you didn't hesitate to judge me, right? So this judgment we thought, from the ignorant, I think is the curse of the Muslim world at the moment. Yeah, that's, that's I think, the biggest loss. It's, there was a built-in pluralism in, in the Islamic thinking that, that has been lost. And, and so uh, uh, I think that's the biggest challenge also for, 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 for you, thinking outside this current dominant consensus and an homogeneous way of, of, of going to Islam. And, um, and for me, that's always a question, but that's my political science bias, to think about what are the institutions that could be created around this new thinking? Well, um, I think the, the institutions are the solution, whether you're political or not. I mean, some of the greatest things that the Khulfa Rashidin, for example, did were to create the Baitul Mal, et cetera, right? Or some of the great innovations that we attribute to the second caliph are the institutions that he created to, to realize these values. And I think whether you're talking about bringing Ahsan into society or bringing good governance, these are products of good institutions. And if institutions are weakened, I mean, uh, in the last two years or the last one year, one of the, the negatives of the current uh, dispensation in Washington is that it is weakening the very institutions that are critical to our democracy. So democracy is not something that we write in our constitution or just go and vote in November. It is various institutions. For example, the checks and balances. If the Congress is not challenging the president, we don't have checks and balances in this country. It may be written in the, in the constitution, but if the institution is not functioning as the institution is designed to do, then it is not. So yes, I think institutions are, are the places. And I think for Muslims, what we need is primary is to build great universities. So, so I often say jokingly, I can raise money like this to get a golden bathroom for a mosque, but not for a library. Yeah. There, there are no libraries in very many, many mosques. So wh what are we talking about? We are leaving our children to learn from YouTube, you know? And so, so that is one of the things to, to, the community has to become knowledge intensive. It has to understand modern knowledge about modernity to understand how to live in modernity. And it also has to know what the fundamental principles of its faith are if it is going to internalize and practice that faith. Otherwise, it's going to live superficially in the modern world and superficially uh, in the Islamic world. 
we have come to our uh, conclusion, and I think it's the best way to conclude. <laughs> so I would like to thank our audience, and um, of course, thank you, Moktader Khan, for your lively and passionate contribution. Yes, get a copy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, and uh, you. see you maybe on another setting, on another Zoom. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I also want to thank everybody who is here and listening and participating. Yes. So and thank you for the great question. It's a wonderful team, makes things happen. <laughs> yes. Thank you for Ruth also for helping us. Ruth, thank yes. you very much. Bye bye now. Bye. bye.